Good evening. Let me adjust this down a little bit. My name is Krista Johnson. I'm studying political science and international studies here at Iowa State. Um, and I'm also a member of the University Committee on Lectures and the National Affairs Series Planning Committee. It's my special honor to introduce tonight's speaker, who has argued 25 court cases before the Supreme Court um, on cases involving federal patent law, class action practice, labor and employment, and disability law. He is also the founder and publisher of SCOTUS Blog, which is devoted to coverage of the Supreme Court and is widely regarded as one of the nation's premier legal internet sites. He is currently with Goldstein and Russell and teaches Supreme Court litigation at both Stanford and Harvard Law Schools. Now please join me in welcoming our speaker, who, is, who the Legal Times praised for, quote, transforming the practice of law before the Supreme Court, Tom Goldstein. Thanks very much. I really appreciate it. Can everybody hear me? We just put this mic on. Yes? Yes? You're still awake. Um, you do me a great honor in inviting me to come and talk with you about the Supreme Court. Can you please just, if you've ever thought it essential that someone who is giving a talk wear a jacket, like a sport coat, please raise your hand. Okay, excellent. There were only two of you. <laughs> Tremendous. And you, you two are evil. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk with you about the Supreme Court, which is what I spend my days and nights thinking about because of my law practice and this website that we have, SCOTUS blog, and uh, because of teaching. And it's really amazing for me to have the opportunity to come and talk with non-lawyers, to be honest, about the court. Recognize that when I do that, it's a little bit challenging because there's a huge variety and depth and breadth of knowledge about the Supreme Court. There are folks who are intimately familiar with it. Uh, there are some lawyers here, I know. Uh, in Supreme Court practice does not require technical proficiency. Um, so there are lawyers here. There are people who are undergraduates, high school students, younger than that. So if at any point I tell you things that you already know, please forgive me, but I'm going to try and get us all on the same page as we think about the Supreme Court and what it can do and how it's changed American life. But as I said when I began, I really appreciate the opportunity. It's late, uh, the fact that you've taken the time to come and uh, listen to me, and then we'll, I'll do this for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have a question and answer session, and then we will drink a lot. Um, I will drink a lot. The, um, uh, but I really would love to get to the point where we're talking about things that interest you, and I hope we do get to, to uh, answer a lot of your questions. So to start out in thinking about how the Supreme Court has changed American life, I need you to kind of visualize something with me, and it's something that I experienced really recently. On June 28th of this year, at the Supreme Court of the United States, it's the last day of the last Supreme Court term. Supreme Court terms go from October, the famous first Monday in October, until the last day of June. It's not set by law that it'll end the last day of June, but it's set by calendar, the justices' calendars, because the justices uh, only stay in town for nine months, and then they go off to very important chamber music festivals in Europe. They're very, very busy people. Uh, and so they have to finish their term at the last day of June. And on the last day of June in this past year, uh, they decided the Affordable, Health, the Affordable Care Act case, the big Obamacare case. And on that day at 10.06 in the morning, you just have to imagine that you're in the courtroom of the Supreme Court. And so there are nine justices there. Uh, and the Chief Justice is in the middle, and the Solicitor General of the United States, Don Verrilli, is sitting at the table up front. Uh, there are congressional staffers all in the audience because everybody knows the Obamacare case is going to be decided that day. And the Chief Justice says, I have the announcement in, and says the name of the case. And this is a real historical moment, and I just want you to kind of imagine being there at that time as the case is decided because it will really start to make more concrete for you the fact that the justices individually, because there's been a lot of talk about the Chief Justice's own vote in the case, right? And the court as an institution really can do foundationally important things uh, in American life. If you just think about what would have happened if the court had gone the other way and instead of five to four upholding the core individual mandate of that statute, it had struck it down. What it would mean for this president, for example, would have meant politically, what it would have meant for health care, what it would have meant for the structure of government. You may think it good or bad, but it would have been a big deal. 
And so just think about that moment. And we're going to use that moment of the decision in the Affordable Health Care case, the Affordable Care Act case, to frame our discussion of kind of how, what the Supreme Court is, what it does, what it's done historically, the problems and issues that it's confronting now, uh, and what it's going to be looking at in the future. So to understand how it is that we got there at that moment, at 10.06, when the Chief Justice starts announcing the opinion, we have to step back and look at the Constitution for just a second. And so Article 3 of the Constitution says there shall be a Supreme Court. It's the, oh, there's only one court that's specified in the Constitution. Uh, all the other courts, the courts of appeals, the trial courts, were created by Congress. And it doesn't actually say in the Constitution that there have to be nine justices. And at different times in our history, there have been more, uh, excuse me, there have been fewer justices, but more than has, more, the number has increased over time. Occasionally, there have actually been even numbers of justices, which is awkward when there are ties. Uh, and, but we've settled into the idea, yeah, it's good to always be able to have an odd number and a tiebreaker. So over time, the justices have, the number of justices has grown. And Article Three establishes the Supreme Court and the other articles of the Constitution uh, establish the other branches of government, which are also in the courtroom the same day. I mentioned that Don Verrilli, the Solicitor General, is there. Well, Don Verrilli, who argued the health care case and was kind of derided, you may have heard some of the commentary about whether he had done a good job or a bad job that day, he represents the President of the United States and the executive branch under the Constitution. And there are congressional staffers there, and they are there on behalf of the legislative branch, which passed the statute, after all. And the weird thing is that when we're trying to figure out if the Affordable Care Act is constitutional, we're in the Supreme Court. Because if you actually read the Constitution, nobody tells you that the answer to the question, is the Affordable Care Act constitutional, or is uh, there are a right to an abortion, is affirmative action constitutional, all of those questions, nothing in the Constitution tells you that actually the Supreme Court gets to decide. The body that decided that the Supreme Court gets to decide all of these questions was the Supreme Court. Now that's pretty cool. If I could just say that actually Tom Goldstein will decide all of these questions, right, if you have that power to announce your own authority of what's called judicial review, but we could call it Tom review. Uh, that would be an amazing thing. And the Supreme Court did that very early on in its history when the great Chief Justice John Marshall uh, said, well, look, we will be the final arbiters of the law. Uh, and that's why we're in the courtroom that day, because while the Constitution sets up a president of the United States whose job is to faithfully, uh, faithfully execute the laws, the Constitution says, while the Constitution sets up a Congress whose job it is to pass the laws, the Supreme Court is given the final role or has taken on the final role and the country is accepted as having the, <coughs> having the responsibility to be the final arbiter of the meaning of the laws that Congress, is pa Congress passes and also the constitutionality of them. Even though the Congress is supposed to pay attention to the Constitution and is not supposed to pass on constitutional laws, even though the President is given the task of enforcing only constitutional laws and obeying the Constitution, it is the Supreme Court <coughs> that ultimately tells us what it is the Constitution means. Now, that means that we have a system of judicial review. So Congress passes a law, the President enforces a law, and the, the courts, all the way up through the Supreme Court, exercise judicial review and tell us what the laws mean and whether or not they're constitutional or not. Over time, the Supreme Court has had to confront all kinds of foundational questions about the meaning of the Constitution, the meaning of different statutes, and it has really ordered and structured some of the most basic things in American life. The reason is that the Constitution is unbelievably vague, it turns out. We're here on Constitution Day. Well, we're not actually here on Constitution Day, but this is the Constitution Day lecture. Constitution Day was September 17th. We're actually doing the 2013 Constitution Day lecture like 11 months early, uh, rather than a month later than Constitution Day. Uh, but the Constitution was uh, finally proved September 17th, 1787, 235 years ago. And the Supreme Court has had to figure out all kinds of things about this incredibly poorly worded is too critical because of the difficult situation you're trying to order a country for the next several hundred years. But uh, we can all agree, I think, vaguely worded documents. So um, uh, take the First Amendment. 
the First Amendment, so that we have the body of the Constitution. I mentioned the articles that set up the Congress and the executive branch and the legislature. Then we had the Bill of Rights and we've had other amendments. The First Amendment tells us that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Well, what's freedom of speech? What's freedom of speech in an internet era? Is a blog protected speech? There's tons and tons of ambiguity in that language. The Fourth Amendment, the right to privacy, <clears throat> that there shall, no, shall, there shall be no unreasonable searches and seizures. Well, what's a reasonable search and what's a reasonable seizure? And the Supreme Court has had to figure that out. Uh, and so on and so forth, gun rights in the Second Amendment, the right to equal protection in the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendments. What is the legislative power? Congress is given the power to regulate commerce between the states. Well, you know, what counts as commerce between the states? So over and over and over, the Supreme Court has been tasked with figuring out, or has taken on the task of figuring out, what does the Constitution mean? And that has given rise to incredible controversies over the nation's history, particularly in the last century, where the court has really shaped American life. So, one of the most famous was the basic question of what power does Congress have to pass laws? There was a time in the early 1900s in which Congress was really having to deal with great economic strain on the country all the way up and into the Great Depression where we really had a problem with the economy tanking. It's you know, the only time that we've faced more economic strain than we have over the past few years in the nation's at least semi-modern history. And Congress started to pass a whole series of very significant laws intended to you know, pick the economy up, get things going, put people to work, working for the government, a lot of government spending and the like. And the Supreme Court and the Congress and the executive branch were at loggerheads over whether that was permissible or not. Because on the one hand, Congress has this kind of vaguely worded power that I mentioned to regulate commerce between the states. On the other hand, there was a sense among kind of legal academics uh, among some judges at the time, that there was a due process right to contract. And that is, you had a right to make decisions about your own work. Your work decisions couldn't be regulated by Congress. So for example, believe it or not, there was huge controversy over child labor laws and whether they were constitutional or not. And the Supreme Court and Congress and the executive branch were just beating their heads against each other with Congress passing these laws intended to get the economy rolling and, and the Supreme Court striking the laws down. And we had the very famous switch in time that saved nine in which the Supreme, there was a proposal that was put forward by the president to actually add justices to the Supreme Court where they faced a problem where there was a five justice majority that was striking down these laws and the president proposed that a certain uh, uh, for every justice over a certain age they would add new members to the court and the kind of fake thing about it was like oh you know they're old they're not up to the job but it was just an attempt to get the president wanted to appoint more people to the Supreme Court so he could have a working Supreme Court majority and the Supreme Court in some sense blinked and said, hey, we are uh, really out of step with the country here. And it's really the most famous moment in our history in which the Supreme Court kind of shifted ground from a 5-4 majority one way to the other way. And all of this economic legislation that was in grave jeopardy was upheld by the Supreme Court. So that was one incredibly important time. And the legacy of that broad reading of Congress's power under the Commerce Clause comes to the fore again <clears throat> in the Affordable Care Act case that we'll come back to in just a minute. Because that's that same fight. And what you have to recognize is that when you're in that courtroom on J June 28th, 2012, you are hearing a discussion of the same thing that was debated in the Supreme Court 100 years before <clears throat> and has been debated the entire time. Because one of the very interesting principles of law, we've mentioned one of them, and that is judicial review, right? The Supreme Court gets to decide what the law means and whether the law is constitutional. Another important principle of law is called stare decisis. Uh, and that's the, a Latin phrase that basically means if it's been decided once, we're going to stick with it. So what that means is if the Supreme Court decides a case one way and decides an issue, you know, this is how we're going to interpret the law and this is how we're going to interpret the Constitution, the general notion is that they won't change their mind five years later and change their mind again five years after that because there's a sense in which the law should be stable and it shouldn't just depend on the vagaries of who happens to be on the Supreme Court at, the at any given time. But the Supreme Court has said that stare decisis 
doesn't really apply so much in constitutional cases. And so in here, again, it's important for us to divide the kind of work that the Supreme Court does. Congress passes a law. You might ask two different questions about that law. One is, what does it mean? That's a question of statutory construction. And the other question you might ask is, is it constitutional? Did Congress have the power to pass the law? And if it did have the power to pass the law, did it nonetheless violate my rights? So just take any example. Say Congress passes a new law about wiretapping. Okay? You might want to know when it is. What is it that that statute means? When is it that you can have your cell phone conversations intercepted? That would be one question you would ask. That's the question of statutory interpretation. And on this question of stare decisis, the Supreme Court would say, once we interpret that law, we're going to stick with that interpretation. If Congress doesn't like that interpretation, it can pass a new law. But even if you understood what the law meant, you had resolved the question of statutory interpretation, you would then ask maybe those two questions about whether the law is constitutional. Does Congress have the power to pass such a law? Almost certainly, because international and interstate communications are classically things that you would expect the Congress to regulate and not the individual states to regulate. And then you might ask another important question, does it nonetheless, if Congress had the power to pass it, does it violate my individual rights? And here you would almost certainly be thinking about your right to privacy, that Fourth Amendment. Is it an unreasonable search or seizure for your cell phone calls to be intercepted, particularly if no judge is giving approval for it? And those would be the kinds of questions you would ask about constitutionality. And there the Supreme Court says, stare decisis, the idea that it's been decided once, means it won't be changed, doesn't apply so much because Congress doesn't have the power to come along and rewrite the Constitution. So when we confronted in the early 1900s this question of Congress's power with the child labor laws and the like, the reason we're debating it 100 years later is that it's Katie bar the door. New Supreme Court justices can come onto the court and change the meaning of the Constitution because the words are sufficiently vague that the justices in some sense have to breathe life into them. And so the Constitution continues to mean different things every 10, 20, 30, 40 years as new problems come up, but as new members of the Supreme Court come on. So the one example that I've given you so far is the early 1900s, this fight over the Commerce Clause, the breadth of Congress's power. Another huge one is race, right? Plessy versus Ferguson. We've had some horrible examples in the country in which not only was racism, which was supposed to be really fought off through the 14th and 15th Amendments, through the Bill of Rights, uh, but it was actually enshrined in the Constitution by the Supreme Court through the early to mid part of the last century. The Supreme Court really was way behind the curve in some sense. Maybe it was a little ahead of the country because the country was behind the curve, but it was way behind the historical curve of recognizing the importance of enforcing the constitutional rights of minorities. But as we got into the middle to the you know, second half of the last century, the Supreme Court really did start to take the 14th, which is about equal protection, and the 15th Amendment, which is about voting rights, started to take them much more seriously. And that's another place where the Supreme Court really reshaped the Constitution, reshaped uh, American life in saying that there can't be state-sponsored discrimination. Another thing to pause on when you're thinking about the Constitution, there's a big difference between how the Constitution applies at a state university, right, at Iowa State, versus how it applies at a private university, and how it applies to the police versus a private security force, how it applies to the federal government in Congress versus a corporation. And the reason is that the Constitution is a restriction on governmental action. There's only one, one provision of the Constitution, really, that applies against private actors. And there's the provision of the Constitution that says you can't put someone into involuntary servitude. <clears throat> so if you're like working for a professor, even at a private university, and he's really terrible to you, you can invoke the Constitution. Uh, but the other provisions of the Constitution only apply as against state actors. And so when you think about racism in the United States, there's a huge problem of private racism, but there was a pro huge problem of governmental racism. And that's what the 14th and 15th Amendments are directed at. And that's what, as we got into the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s, the Supreme Court <coughs> started to take seriously. And through decisions involving, for example, school desegregation in particular, in which the court really said, 
we are going to force through decisions like Brown versus the Board of Education and its successors, we're going to take seriously the notion that you can't have separate but equal facilities. And that really did take the Supreme Court putting its foot down and causing the president to send troops into certain school districts in the South in order to enforce the mandate of the Constitution, unquestionably an area in which the Supreme Court reshaped American life when it comes to race. But as I'm going to give you three or four examples, and then we're going to talk about the same debates happening in the Supreme Court last year or this year. Race is coming back to the Supreme Court. Take privacy. So famously, in the 1960s and 1970s, the Supreme Court really decided to confront police misbehavior and bad police practices. We had a real problem in the country in which uh, police officers were kind of just, you know, obviously trying to protect the public, but really not paying a lot of attention to people's rights. And that's when the Supreme Court started to really enforce things like the exclusionary rule. So, Maybe you all have seen this scenario. Everybody's seen uh, police cases uh, on television. So the police come in. They don't have a warrant. They search the house. They find the drugs. The, it goes to court, and the drugs are suppressed. You can't put them into evidence, right? Well, the odd thing about that is the Supreme Court made that up. When I went to law school and graduated in 1995, I thought that this thing, the exclusionary rule, was essentially written into the Constitution. But it's another place where the Supreme Court had to interpret the vague language of a constitutional provision. So the exclusionary rule says, if the police violate that Fourth Amendment right, that there won't be any unreasonable searches and seizures, that they can't use the evidence against you. They can't just barge in, violate the Constitution, find something, and then prosecute you with it, right? Well, that exclusionary rule is made up by the Supreme Court because the Constitution says there won't be any unreasonable searches and seizures, but doesn't say what happens if there are. And so what the Warren Court, the, the, the Supreme Court, uh, courts are known by the name of the Chief Justice. So we're in the Roberts Court right now. Before that, we had the Rehnquist Court. We had the Warren and Berger Courts. The Warren Court set, came up with this idea of the exclusionary rule and said, if the Fourth Amendment is violated, we're going to exclude the evidence. That was another significant area in which they changed uh, the country because it caused the police to take the Fourth Amendment more seriously. But they also recognized other things, like a right to counsel, that if you are going to uh, be charged with a felony, then you have a right to a lawyer, and the government has to provide you with a lawyer. Because there were a ton of people who were being prosecuted and had no real way of defending themselves. And there were a whole array of judicial and police procedure questions that made a fundamental difference in the fairness and how, of how people are prosecuted in this country. That's another thing, uh, way in that the Supreme Court changed America, and that too is being revisited. And we can go through another list. Famously, abortion. Roe versus Wade. And Roe versus Wade is a tremendous illustration of the tensions between trying to figure out what the Constitution means and separate that from what you believe personally. So I'll, this is a perfect opportunity. How many people here believe that Roe versus Wade, at least when it's interpreted, generates some right to an abortion that uh, that's correctly decided? How many people believe that's correctly decided? All right, and how many people believe it's incorrectly decided and that the Constitution doesn't guarantee that right? Okay, and then there are a lot of people who haven't thought uh, uh, about it. It's perfectly fine. Now, what I want to know is how many people, when they believe that it's rightly decided or wrongly decided, that's the opposite of their personal views about abortion? Right, so how many people here, for example, believe that there is a constitutional right to abortion but are morally opposed to abortion? Or how many people believe that it's not recognized in the Constitution but, but believe that there should be such a right? <coughs> there are a couple people, but it is really interesting when you think about all of these sorts of questions, when there is this room to maneuver in the Constitution, how you're no fundamentally different from Supreme Court justices and how you have to really recognize in a court that evolves, that it changes over time, that its composition follows the presidential elections. As pre you know, more conservative presidents appoint more conservative justices, President Obama is going to appoint more liberal justices, that it's so hard on all of these questions, whether it's about 
broad federal power versus state power. Think about folks who really believe in the kind of Tea Party vision of libertarianism and smaller federal government. If it's about police power, <coughs> depending on what you think of the cops or not, uh, when it comes to things like abortion, when it comes to race, all of these are infused with our personal experiences. And while that's true for you, and you want to think that it's not true of the justices, it really is. They all come to the cases with all of their own personal context, biases, beliefs, and the like. And abortion is really one where kind of all of those social issues are epitomized more than in anything else. So the Supreme Court in Roe versus Wade recognizes a federal constitutional right in the kind of what was known, what's been called the penumbras of the 14th Amendment, which means I can't really find it in there, but I really think it's there. I happen to, you know, I, I'm not trying to be critical of the recognition of the right, but it is, you know, there is something to the criticism of it's hard to locate in the text of the Constitution. Um, and in the, the right to privacy, but at the same time, there are other things that aren't in the text of the Constitution that almost everybody believes really are fundamental rights. So for example, the same right that undergirds Roe versus Wade also is the right to contraception. There actually were states where you couldn't, for, for even for some married couples, but certainly for unmarried couples, couldn't get contraception, right? And so there are these rights that the Supreme Court over time has recognized. Among them is uh, the abortion right, and that too is uh, constantly being revisited. So what I've tried to identify for you is three or four or five ways that I think is common ground we could recognize are instances in which the Supreme Court has changed the country, whether it's on the question of abortion, whether it's race relations in the United States, it's the power of the federal government. And now what I want you to recognize is that everything that is serious in American law and American constitutional law in particular is hotly contested. I mentioned to you before that this notion of stare decisis, that we've decided it once, so we're going to stick with it, doesn't really apply in constitutional law. And that means that if you believe that these earlier cases decided from about 1910 through about 1970 are wrong, the battle is never done for you. Because you can always reshape the Supreme Court in a way that will cause those issues to be revisited. And that's exactly what's happening. So in the Reagan administration, that's where a group of lawyers really came together who had concluded that the Supreme Court in the previous decades had been literally out of control. It had just been making crap up. That, you know, the, the, we had the Constitution, you look at the Constitution, and I look at the thing, it doesn't have anything about abortion in it. It doesn't have this exclusionary rule in it. The federal government is completely out of control, was their view, in terms of agri agri uh, taking on too much power for itself and excluding the states. And they set a mission under Attorney General Meese uh, to reshape the Supreme Court and get the Supreme Court and their reading of the Constitution back under control in their views. And one of the, among the many incredibly important young lawyers to this effort were John Roberts, now the Chief Justice of the United States, and Sam Alito, uh, Justice of the Supreme Court. And you can agree with them or you can disagree with them, but what you have to recognize is that they grew up professionally in an environment in which they had a very strongly held belief that the Supreme Court had gone totally off the rails and needed to be brought back into a better, narrower reading of the Constitution. And what you are seeing across an array of issues is the effort of a decades long, is the results of a decades long effort to reshape American law, reshape the reading of the Constitution into a way that they think is more correct. And so now let's just go through that same list of issues that you might have thought was kind of foundationally settled, really core important constitutional things. Remember, we are 235 years past <coughs> the, act, the signing of the Constitution. You would think we would have gotten our act together and figured out what the thing meant. You'd be wrong. Because nothing is ever finally settled. And when you go to law school, if you go to law school, when your kids go to law school, if your kids go to law school, your, their grandchildren, whatever, all these debates will continue to happen. <clears throat> so take race. This term, the Supreme Court is hearing oral arguments in Fisher versus the University of Texas. That is the question of the constitutionality of affirmative action in public school and uh, uh, university in particular admissions. Now the Supreme Court 
confronted this question just nine years ago. And it held by a five to four majority in, in a case involving the University of Michigan Law School called Grutter that public universities are entitled to use race as a factor in evaluating applicants in setting up their admissions classes. And that was a case in which Sandra Day O'Connor, our former swing vote, was in the majority, provided the fifth vote. And she said, I think that my sense of the matter is that 25 years from now, mostly affirmative action won't be required. But until then, at the very least, this is part of the transition away from a sorry history of race relations and the treatment of minorities in the country, and it's constitutional. And the basic view of those who favor affirmative action is that the 14th Amendment, which guarantees equal protection of the laws, is intended to help minorities. And so it doesn't invalidate a statute that is also intended to help minorities. On the other hand, the more conservative view, the dissenters of that case, of the Grutter case, say the thing says equal protection of the laws and it was intended to end racial discrimination. And if you separate people on the basis of race, if you say African Americans and Hispanics and Latinos, they're going to have a special treatment. What you're doing is you are actually isolating them more by making us focus more on race and you are at the very least discriminating against whites. And so that's actually racial discrimination. And those are just two incredibly competing views of that 14th Amendment and what its promise of equal protection means. And what happened after nine years ago in that Grutter case when it was decided, the Supreme Court changed. Sandra Day O'Connor, her husband, had gotten Alzheimer's. And she decided that she was going to go and take care of him. And so she resigned from the Supreme Court. There was actually a very odd situation where uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist, and she uh, came and met. And Chief Justice Rehnquist had anaplastic thyroid cancer, which is an incredibly debilitating, it's a, it's a very nasty cancer. And he was dying, uh, but didn't really want to admit it. And he said to Sandra Day O'Connor, well, we can't both leave at the same time because of how difficult it is to get justices confirmed through the Senate. And she, it was a very awkward conversation, and she interpreted that as meaning that she needed to go ahead and retire. Uh, and so she did. Uh, and while her, she said, I will retire upon the appointment of my successor, and while that was all pending, Rehnquist died. And her husband also, his condition deteriorated to the point where I think if she had had the opportunity, she would have stayed on the Supreme Court. But it didn't work out that way. She didn't have the opportunity to, and so she retired. And she's actually very active in retirement. The upshot is this very personal series of events, the kind of miscommunication between her and Rehnquist in that one meeting even, what was going on with her husband, led to a situation in which John Roberts replaced William Rehnquist, but Sam Alito replaced Sandra Day O'Connor. And that one move in the Supreme Court from a, you know, she was appointed by President Reagan, she was a conservative, but she was a centrist conservative, kind of was, might go in either way in any given case, with Sam Alito, who's a much more solidly conservative justice, has meant that a whole series of issues that were settled 10 years ago in one direction are now swinging dramatically in the other. And so on this question of race, Whereas the Supreme Court just nine years ago had said that affirmative action is constitutional, they have, the people who voted that way have lost their fifth vote. And having four votes in the Supreme Court is nothing but depressing. Uh, it doesn't get you anything. It will not even get you the proverbial cup of coffee. You have to have five votes in the Supreme Court. And the left and the center of the court that would combine with the left have lost their vote. And so the Supreme Court this term is going to dramatically, dramatically constrain affirmative action in public education because the, now there's a conservative majority on the Supreme Court, right or wrong, I'm not trying to be critical or endorse it, but right or wrong believes that affirmative action in school admissions is discrimination. <clears throat> and so in the Fisher case, they're going to say that um, you, it's very rare that public, education, public, public educational institutions can have uh, race as a factor in admissions. Take abortion. The Supreme Court under Sandra Day O'Connor, its most recent major abortion case was called Gonzalez versus Carhart, and it involved the, the kind of horrifying subject, very difficult to talk about, of so-called partial birth abortion, a very gruesome procedure, rarely used, but it nonetheless held very symbolic value 
uh, for those who uh, are opposed to Roe and also for those who are trying to preserve the right. And under Senator Day O'Connor, the Supreme Court had decided five to four that if you were going to have that kind of statute, you could ban that procedure, but you had to have an exception for the health of the mother. Sandra Day O'Connor leaves, Sam Alito comes to the Supreme Court, and in a case involving the same doctor, also called, this, another case called Carhartt, the Supreme Court contr- confronted a federal statute and on the exact same issue came out the other way and said, no, you don't have to have that exception. So race, abortion, um, and now we come in the Affordable Care Act to the Commerce Clause. So on June 28th, as the Supreme Court is announcing the decision on Obamacare, we are confronting again one of the big issues that one might have thought were settled in the earlier part of the last century. And from 10.06 through 10.12 in the morning, the Chief Justice explains why it is that the Commerce Clause is narrower than really anybody thought it was in a very significant respect. So the argument in the Affordable Care Act case, just to take you down into the weeds for just a second, is that the individual mandate that underlies the federal health care legislation, which says that in the main people are going to have to buy health care, the idea behind the statute is that we're going to take people, basically the people in this room, the healthy people, right? Too many healthy people are not getting insurance because they don't feel that they need it. People, young people who are in pretty good shape are saying, insurance is expensive, I don't think I'm going to get that sick, and so they're underinsuring. As a consequence, they are not taking on the risk. You're, if you don't enter the insurance risk pool, if you don't buy insurance, then what happens is the insurers don't have enough healthy people who aren't going to need health care. All they have is people who are more sick, and insurance gets really expensive and becomes harder and harder to get. So the idea of the individual mandate is that they're going to make you buy insurance, even though in a sense you don't really need it as much, so that you can make insurance less expensive for everybody else, and so that we'll have more affordable health care. It's, kind of, it's a subsidy in a sense. Uh, and so the argument in the Affordable Care, affordable care Act case was that Congress, which I mentioned, has the power to regulate commerce between the states. And one would think, you know, healthcare, last time I checked, it's like worth $30 trillion in commerce, right? This isn't exactly some tiny little thing. And uh, healthcare companies and hospitals deal with interstate stuff all the time. Well, the argument in the Affordable Health Care Act case was the clever notion that, yes, you can regulate commerce between the states, but you can't create it. The idea was that by forcing you to buy insurance, they were creating the commerce that they wanted to regulate. And in kind of the legal world, this was kind of laugh out loud funny. Just the whole notion that insurance and massive health care issues weren't regulatable by Congress was regarded as completely you know, silly uh, and kind of crazy. But the Supreme Court that morning on June 28th actually agrees with it. A majority of the Supreme Court says that's absolutely right. Congress doesn't have the power to create commerce and thereby significantly changed potentially the scope of federal power in a rule, announcing a rule 235 years after the Constitution gets signed that never had existed before. And in fact, came very close to completely you know, shifting the uh, groundwork of health care in the country and the shape of the presidential election by invalidating the president's signature achievement because, as has been rumored, but the rumors are actually true, the Chief Justice had voted not just to accept this argument about the Commerce Clause, but it had actually voted to invalidate the statute altogether. But he had changed his mind between the oral argument in the case and the decision coming down. And that is just an incredible illustration for you, not just how the Supreme Court can change American life, but how one person sitting back, reading all the briefs, listening to the oral arguments, and just mulling the question over and trying to get it right, one individual person, one individual vote in the Supreme Court can change American life. Because I think we'd all have to agree 
that if the statute had been invalidated, things would be very different. The whole presidential election would be different. The availability of health care for people would be different. Better, worse, who cares? But it would have been a very different situation. And that's, in some sense, a good illustration for you of why it's <coughs> not exactly right to say how the Supreme Court changes American life. And maybe the right way to look at it is how individual justices can change American life. And how it is right to say that maybe there isn't a Supreme Court, but there are nine different people who have vastly different views, who come together in different majorities. Because if you were to say, look, <coughs> has President Obama changed American life? Would, how, how many people believe that President Obama has changed American life? A, a substantial plurality, at least. Now, but you would never really say, has the White House changed American life, right? Because the White House changes based, you would say that's true, but it would be kind of a meaningless statement. It wouldn't tell you very much because who's in the White House would tell you much more about how the executive branch has changed American life, and so too with the Supreme Court. And it depends very much on the individual justices and the fact that John Roberts voted one way to invalidate the statute and changed his mind, but still adopted a very conservative legal rule eventually upholding the statute under another provision of the Constitution, the tax power, uh, is a good way of thinking about the Supreme Court <coughs> because it really puts a fine point on the fact that the presidency matters when it comes to the Supreme Court. And it's kind of amazing how many people here who are eligible to vote are going to vote in like one of the top three things will be in terms of your choice of a presidential candidate will be Supreme Court appointments. You came to this lecture, so it's kind of cheating. You, you know, the people who are here have a greater interest than most in the Supreme Court. But even then, we're talking about 20% of the people in this room. And it's really interesting because the lasting legacy of a president, if you say, you know, what is the lasting legacy of Ronald Reagan right now in American life? You know, what's the lasting legacy of the first President Bush? The longest lasting legacy of our presidents in some respects is really their Supreme Court appointments because now there's this real emphasis on putting people on the Supreme Court when they're basically teenagers. Like who's going to be the next Supreme Court appointee? You have to look at the people who are like 43, 44, or 45. People who went to law school at the time that I did uh, and that's how you're going to really get a sense of someone's going to go onto the Supreme Court, be appointed and be there for 25 or 30 or 35 years when the president is long, long, long gone. Um, so those are some illustrations of you, for you of things that the Supreme Court you know, settled at one time, have become unsettled, are being revisited again. Another excellent example I should have given, because I mentioned it before, is the exclusionary rule. Remember how I said in the Warren Court era, they found that if there was a violation of the right against unreasonable searches and seizures, they would exclude the evidence under the exclusionary rule. Well, the Supreme Court has said that it's not going to expand the exclusionary rule at all <coughs> anymore. Four justices have said they would overrule the exclusionary rule and allow the evidence to come into the trial, even when there was a Fourth Amendment violation. And if, the just, if one more justice, one more conservative justice comes onto the Supreme Court, they will uh, eliminate the exclusionary rule altogether. And if one more conservative justice comes onto the Supreme Court, there's an excellent chance that Roe v. Wade will be, if not overruled entirely, it will be significantly limited. Again, you may think that's the greatest thing ever. You may think it's the worst thing ever. But it is really interesting how, while we're so used to Congress changing the law all the time, we have just this felt sense of the Constitution as being more immutable than the vagaries of new Congresses coming in. And it turns out not to be true. So. Let me then just flag for you the big issues, the big constitutional issues that are coming to the Supreme Court this term. Uh, and you can see kind of how, as time evolves over the course of the nation's history, still it's amazing the new questions that come to the justices or new variations on old questions. Uh, and it'll be really interesting to see what the justices do with them. And then I'll stop and we'll talk about questions and we'll start drinking. Um, so the big case this term I've mentioned already, Fisher, the affirmative action case. The next big case is that on November 26th, the Supreme Court is going to announce that it is taking up same-sex marriage. 
Now, it could take up same-sex marriage in either of two different contexts. One is the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. Section 3 of DOMA is the provision of law that says we have a federal definition of marriage. And what the federal definition of marriage has always been is that if you are married in a state, then you are married for purposes of federal law, and that might mean you get you know, the, the benefit of various provisions of the estate tax, various survivor benefits, all kinds of things. So thousands of provisions of very complicated federal law. DOMA says, for federal law purposes, we're changing that, sorry. Instead, in order to be recognized as married for purposes of federal law, you have to be an opposite sex couple. And there have been a number of constitutional challenges to that, saying that, look, if my state is willing to recognize my same-sex marriage, you have no justification in the federal government suddenly changing and refusing to recognize that. And every federal court, pretty much, that has considered that question, including the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in New York today, has held that Section 3 of DOMA is unconstitutional. It's a very interesting illustration because remember I mentioned that the President's representative, Don Verrilli, is in court with us on June 28th waiting to hear if the Affordable Care Act has been upheld or struck down. Well, the Obama administration has refused to defend this statute, <clears throat> a very unusual maneuver. The President is constitutionally assigned the responsibility to give force and effect to laws that Congress passes. But there is a recognized exception that if the president believes the law is unconstitutional, he can refuse to enforce it. And in that case, then the Congress can defend the law itself. And that's what's happening in DOMA. So the Supreme Court is going to take up same-sex marriage, maybe in, definitely in that context. They will take up DOMA for sure. But the other case they have in front of them is Prop 8. So... Proposition 8, that litigation is over the situation in California where the California Supreme Court recognized a state constitutional, <clears throat> not federal constitutional, right to same-sex marriage, and then California voters in an initiative overturned that and got same-sex marriage taken out of the California Constitution. And the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit out west ruled that giving someone a right to same-sex marriage and then taking it away for reasons essentially of hate and invidious discrimination, that's unconstitutional. And so the Supreme Court may take up Prop 8 at the same time that it takes up the uh, DOMA question. Uh, other significant issues involving privacy are going to be in front of the justices this year. So take, um, uh, there are two good examples. One is going to be DNA testing. So a number, the federal government and a number of states have passed laws that say if you are arrested, if you're arrested, we will take a blood sample from you and we will test your blood against a database of uh, people that we know, we don't know who they are, but they committed crimes, right? And so at what point, you haven't been convicted of anything, but being arrested, what privacy interest do you have in your own DNA? It's a very, very interesting question. Another privacy question that's coming in front of the justices this year, you are pulled over, the officer thinks that you have been drunk. Now, they don't have time to go to a judge before alcohol would drain out of your system, would you know, break down. So can the officer require you to take a blood test uh, at that time? Or do they, are they kind of stuck, unable to test you uh, if there hasn't been an accident or anything else? Um, two more privacy cases involve drug-sniffing dogs. We have a general rule under the Constitution the reasonable expectation of privacy says that if we're going to do a search of you, then we are going to have to go ask a judge. But can the cops come up to your door with a drug dog and sniff underneath your door? The Supreme Court said in a case called Kylo that they couldn't come to your house with a heat, um, a machine that can look through the walls in a sense, and a thermal imager, and see kind of what's going on, looking for grow lights. None of us know what that is. But the, um, the very high-powered lights that grow ferns and things uh, inside homes. Um, and the Supreme Court said looking into the house that way is a search. Well, what about sniffing under the door looking for marijuana? Is that? Um, and so on and so forth. Can you patent genes is in front of the Supreme Court this term. An incredibly important question for the future of science and technology and so on and so forth. So my point to you is not that any one of these cases is necessarily more important than the others, although the same-sex marriage thing is certainly very, very interesting, but rather that 
you know, I could come back or you could talk with your friends next year and the year after and the year after and the year after and lots of things that you imagine were already decided by the Supreme Court may get undecided and decided the other way or new questions of technology, new questions of privacy and the like are constantly coming up. Uh, and the justices are always have in front of them uh, the uh, different ways in which they are reshaping American life because of how they read the Constitution and read various statutes. Uh, so maybe I'll stop there and we can talk for a while just about questions um, uh, that you may have about the court and about appointments and the election and all of those sorts of things. <clears throat> but thank you very much. So it, it looks like Pat has a, a microphone. Is that how we're going to do this? Is that right? And do you want to bring the microphone to people or do you want people to go to the microphone? They can go to the mic or okay. you can answer their questions. Sure, I want people there. to be able to hear the questions. So uh, do you want to go to the microphone or I'll repeat the question? Okay. I'll yell it out. All right. Right. Yes. What kind of control does that leave with the Supreme Court in the future? Yeah. Well, so just to, let's go ahead and play it out with one more level of detail. The question is, so we could just talk a little bit more about how Obamacare was decided and kind of what the upshot of the legal rule is. So we've settled the fact earlier on that it's not in Congress's power to create commerce. On the other hand, the Constitution gives power to Congress to tax. And it's the case that what happens actually with the Affordable Care Act is if you don't buy health insurance, you don't go to jail. Instead, what happens is that you are required to pay a tax on your 1040 form. It actually is the case that if you don't pay the tax, nothing happens to you, weirdly. It's a very unusual tax. The only thing that can happen, the government has a very funny line in its brief that says, well, if you don't pay the tax, you may be called by an internal revenue agent to encourage you to pay the tax. Um, but the Congress actually wrote a provision of law that says in this very unusual tax that you can't be prosecuted for not paying the tax. What they can do is withhold your tax refunds. But it has a very limited enforcement mechanism. And I will say that it's a very odd vision of the Constitution, right or wrong. Because one of the things that you, the, the parties arguing against the statute said, look, we know that there is this taxing power and we know that it's on your 1040 form. But everybody in Congress swore up and down and the president said when it was enacted that this is not a tax. Because the, remember the political environment. <clears throat> if everyone had been frank and honest and said this thing is a tax, it would have never passed because everyone was so anti-tax. And the Supreme Court said, we're not going to really talk about that. Uh, the Supreme Court said, look, it looks and walks and talks like a tax. And even if Congress formally said it wasn't a tax, it's still a tax. So the rule of law that comes out of the decision is very mixed in a sense. And that is Congress can't create commerce but it can force you to pay money if you don't create commerce. Uh, and so it can do, accomplish basically the same thing. Uh, and so one would have, you know, if one were imagining creating a constitution, would you really write a constitution like that? Would it make much sense for you to say, I care so much about limiting Congress's power that I'm going to tell them they can't create commerce. Oh, but then you know you can tax people if they if they won't create the commerce for you. It it, uh, it I admit that it doesn't hold together very well for me. What it does do though is it puts the Supreme Court in a pretty good spot. The conservative majority of the Supreme Court adopted there and a couple of other places some very significant rules of law going forward. Uh, particularly in, the other, in another part of the challenge that doesn't get talked about very much, but didn't upend a massive piece of economic legislation, which it really hadn't done since that period that I mentioned at the very beginning of the last century. And so what it did do, I think, is insulate the Supreme Court. I'm not saying that this is what John Roberts was trying to do, but one of the upshots of what happened is that it has really insulated the Supreme Court from political attack as being too aggressive, too active, but nonetheless created some very conservative legal rules. And so I think that's probably the, the, the lasting legacy of the decision. Yes? Um, maybe one of your daily words. I will talk about it anyway, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes. Yeah. Sure. So this is the something you all have seen a ton about, and that's the retention in the wake of the same-sex marriage uh, decision uh, in Iowa. This is an unusual situation. We have seen around the country for a variety of reasons uh, people be you know voted out on the basis of decisions. Judicial elections are a very odd thing in my book. You know, you want the under Article Three of the Constitution, federal judges are appointed. They're not elected, and they're appointed for life assuming good behavior and everybody behaves well enough to satisfy that standard. We never kick our federal judges out. Um, in other places where you have elected judiciaries, it seems to me, and particularly where you have after Citizens United, which is another big change in the law, right or wrong, where the Supreme Court has recognized a much stronger First Amendment right to spend money in electoral campaigns, where you have judges being voted in and voted out, I really worry about the independence of the judiciary. Uh, and it is, you know, it is relatively rare around the country for one decision to so endanger uh, state Supreme Court justices' position on a court. But it is purely a question of state law. And that is even though what might be recognized, the state courts have to handle both state law questions and federal law questions. And so imagine that a state Supreme Court, the Iowa Supreme Court, recognizes a federal different in this situation, but imagines uh, it recognizes a federal constitutional right to same-sex marriage. Or what happens that judges sometimes get criticized for, they issue a big death penalty ruling. The death penalty is unconstitutional or something like that. Even though they are deciding a question of federal law, if they get voted out, if the system in the state is that we vote in people, we have retention elections, we can recall justices, that is not a problem. Uh, it may be a problem, but it is not unconstitutional, and it can never get to the U.S. Supreme Court. It cannot. That is a question for the states. They pick their own people and put them on and take them off as they see fit. I do, because, I, look, it turns out, I think, that Citizens United is not going to change the balance of the presidential election. Each side has roughly $60 trillion that they're spending in the election. But take Citizens United and put it on a more granular scale and think about judicial elections, right? So you might think the plaintiff's bar is trying to buy the state judiciary. You might think the state chamber of commerce is trying to buy the state judiciary. But there are elections that are cheaper than the presidency that don't cost literally a billion dollars, where $100,000 or $200,000 can make a huge, huge difference in a state like this one. And that's where I think that Citizens United is actually deeply unfortunate because people who have national agendas or just have a lot of money can come in and really reshape uh, the, ability, the public's perception of any, indiv any individual race. And think again about your state Supreme Court in the same way you think about the U.S. Supreme Court, where a single vote can make the difference. And if you can change that dynamic, you can change in a way that you, know, you would have to change the entire state legislature to have the same effect. And so that's where I think is the overlooked, unfortunate legacy of Citizens United is in state elections, in particular state judicial elections. Ma'am. I want to stay with us. Uh, Citizens United. Yeah. How did a, a corporation is a legal construct. Yes. How did it ever get to be a country with the first right? Yeah. So, right. So Citizens United, uh, one of the so just to step back, every, most people know what this is, but Citizens United overrules a prior body of Supreme Court precedent and says that corporations have a right to spend unlimited amounts of money, however much money they want, in elections, that they are like people too. Now they can't contribute to candidates, just like people can't contribute to candidates. Um, and the notion is that corporations have are represented an important part of society, an important uh, aggregation of wealth, or it may be a viewpoint, but that there are a lot of rights actually that apply to corporations. So for, to take the simplest example, when we were talking about uh, unreasonable searches and seizures, imagine what's a company that has a big plant near here? John Deere. John Deere, OK. So the police can't come into John Deere and search through John Deere's files, right? 
That would be an unreasonable search and seizure. It would violate the Constitution. It would violate their rights. Uh, you couldn't have, let's assume that you had a corporation that principally served African Americans. You couldn't have a law that says that corporation can no longer continue to operate in the state of Iowa. That would violate the Equal Protection Clause. And so it actually is the case that a variety of provisions of the Constitution kind of uncontroversially uh, do apply to corporations. But, but the application of it, to, uh, the First Amendment, and the ability to spend this amount of money in elections is a substantially more controversial thing. Because of, look, you just got to, this is, this is a real dilemma. Look, if someone came up to you and said, look, we know you care passionately that Mitt Romney should be elected or Barack Obama should be elected, but we're not going to let you talk about that. Obviously a violation of the First Amendment. What if they came up to you and they said, you can talk about it all you want, but you were going to pay $1,000 to spend, to put flyers up on campus. We're not going to let you do that. Probably still, obviously, a violation of the First Amendment. You want to participate in the electoral process. And so it's very hard to draw lines of what's okay and what's not okay. Now, I happen to come down on the side of saying that Citizens United is wrong and that it really creates a distortion in democracy to allow such massive amounts of money to be spent. But you can, I can see the other side of it because it's just so hard to know when you're dealing with something that's so fundamental, which is participation in elections, which is really what the First Amendment is at its core about, uh, exactly where to say that this is okay but that's not. Oops. Uh, let them vote? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a good example of a provision of the Constitution that does not apply to corporations. It doesn't apply to a lot of people. Um, but a absolutely, I think that there are, that's another, another good example of hard lines to draw of what rights corporations have and which ones they don't. Absolutely. You've had some great opportunities to argue for the U.S. Supreme Court. Could you give us a little bit of insight in what it's like? Sure. So this is a great part of my day job. I argued at my 26th case uh, last week, and my 27th case will be in three weeks. Uh, it's a very intense thing to argue in front of the Supreme Court because we have uh, eight justices who are very active. Justice Thomas famously does not ask questions. He asked, he asked me a question seven years ago, and that was the second to last question that he asked. I, I may have just put him off the whole idea of asking questions. Um, and, you know, in the course, we get 30 minutes. It used to be that Supreme Court oral arguments would last days or weeks. Uh, and can you imagine listening to me for days or weeks? Uh, and so they've cut it down to 30 minutes per side. And you can get asked in that time, just to give an example, Sonia Sotomayor, <coughs> Obama appointee, who believes in the constitutionality of affirmative action, that one justice asked 22 questions of the plaintiffs in the Fisher affirmative action case. John Roberts, the chief justice, believes that there are real constitutional problems with affirmative action. He asked 27 questions of the lawyer for the University of Texas. Now, those are individual justices, and then you multiply that out, and it's basically just a kind of firestorm. The other interesting thing about Supreme Court oral arguments is that the justices, they decide about 70 cases a year, and for judges, that's not many. And they have four law clerks each, and they do a huge amount of preparation for the cases. And so when they come to oral argument, they don't have a lot of actual questions. They've thought a lot about it. They have all these briefs. In some cases, they may have 100 briefs already. The oral argument is, ironically, the opportunity for them to talk to their colleagues, because they don't meet about the cases ahead of time. And so really, a lot of Supreme Court questions are statements of position with a question mark at the end. <laughs> Isn't it the case that, as they try and persuade their colleagues, and all I am is just the, I just have the best seat for hearing what's going to happen in my case as they bounce things off me uh, to try and persuade their colleagues. So, you know, the amount, the, the amount that I can actually accomplish in an oral argument is limited for that reason. And so in an oral argument, what I'm actually trying to do is try and find the one justice who's open to persuasion about just one or two points, figure that out, and just survive uh, the rest of the time. But it's certainly, you know, it's great fun. Uh, as soon as it's over. <laughs> yes. 
Well, let's talk in very specific terms. The question of what happens to Roe after Mitt Romney is elected, if that were to happen, really depends. It's a two-stage thing. What happens to the Supreme Court? So for a while, the average age of Supreme Court justices was 126. It was a very old Supreme Court. That's no longer as true. You know, we do have a bunch of, you know, we have uh, several justices who are more newly appointed who are in their 50s now. But if Mitt Romney is elected, then our two oldest judges who are conservatives would be the ones who might conceivably retire in Justice Scalia and Justice Kennedy, Justice Kennedy being our center vote. The oldest justice on the court, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, who is 78, will do anything possible to not retire under Mitt Romney. She will go into cryogenic freezing under the, in the summer. Okay? Uh, she will have her, her, her body rolled up to the bench. Okay? Uh, and that's just the way things are now. Justices, when they voluntarily retire, they retire under a president who will appoint someone essentially the same ideologically. And so what is going on with all of these retirements is the question of when someone will literally run out of time and that they will involuntarily retire under a president. So if regrettably something were to happen to Ruth Ginsburg under Mitt Romney or the reverse under a second term of Barack Obama, then the law could change. So you have one big assumption and that is what will happen to Ruth Ginsburg because she won't voluntarily retire. But let's assume something unfortunate happens and she leaves. Well. Justice Kennedy, who's our center vote, who's quite conservative, believes that existing abortion jurisprudence gives too much power to Roe versus Wade. And he has strongly signaled that he would limit the abortion right already. So the Supreme Court hasn't had an abortion case in a few years. They have just, you know, people have not been litigating them. States haven't been passing a lot of the statutes. Uh, and so we don't have an immediate abortion controversy in the Supreme Court. But if Mitt Romney were able to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg with somebody who's more conservative than Justice Kennedy. And Republican presidents have gotten so good at getting really solidly conservative justices onto the Supreme Court. Uh, John Roberts, Sam Alito, we had this thing of David Souter, who was appointed by the first President Bush, there became this mantra of no more suitors among Republicans, that they just thought that he was way too liberal. He was a kind of Northeastern Republican. Uh, and uh, so you would expect that whoever would replace Ruth Ginsburg would be substantially more conservative, and Roe versus Wade would either be overruled outright, but that's probably a little unlikely because of what would happen in the country. You know, you just take the example of the Affordable Care Act. The Supreme Court tries not to create massive controversy, but it would be substantially limited. And what that would mean is that it wouldn't mean that abortion was illegal. It would mean it would depend on where you lived. And states, more conservative states, would be much more willing to pass uh, more significant restrictions. Um, and so it would vary. The availability of the abortion right would vary tremendously from state to state. All right, we have time for one more question with the big group. But if you have additional questions, we invite you to join us with the reception afterwards with uh, Mr. Goldstein. So one more question. Sir. Uh, you brought a favorite cigarette. Yeah. Sure. Well, it actually has been the case, and this was the great frustration for Republicans. It was actually the case that not infrequently Republican appointees would move to the left. Now, they would always deny it, but if you take David Souter from the first President Bush, John Paul Stevens, who was really the leader of the left on the Supreme Court, um, Harry Blackman, who wrote Roe v. Wade, um, appointed by Nixon, there are th those are the three most significant examples of people expecting very conservative results from justices and them turning out to be substantially more liberal. And that will never happen again <laughs> for just that reason. Republicans in particular have come to really value the judiciary. Now, that's not to say that Democrats are unaware of the importance of the Supreme Court, but you just look, President Obama invested himself in the Affordable Care Act, not in getting judges appointed to the lower courts, which he has been, he has a really bad track record on both for his failure to appoint and Republicans being really good at blocking them. Uh, but Republican presidents invest themselves in judges and Supreme Court justices. And they've created an incredible farm team. 
so that uh, Mitt Romney will not have to look far at all to find you know, a dozen candidates who are 45 years old, who have incredibly rock-solid conservative credentials. And you just take one great example of how the Republican base will not permit that kind of what they regard as a mistake again, and that's Harriet Myers. Remember, the second President Bush takes Harriet Myers, who's a Republican, a good friend, he knows well, and people went bananas on her nomination to the Supreme Court because the Republican base really cares about judges and said, we want someone who has a solid, established, conservative track record. And, no, and you know, she was forced to withdraw uh, because of the firestorm from her ideological team, if you will. And because of that, no Republican president will make the same mistake. What is really unfortunate and very interesting to watch is what happens with a Mitt Romney as president, for example, and a Democratic Senate, right? If you try and put on somebody who's really conservative, will Democrats filibuster? Will they vote the nominee down? Uh, what will happen at that point? Because uh, a Republican president will is only going to appoint somebody who's very, very conservative. Now, of course, President Obama's nominees are regarded by Republicans and conservatives as extremely liberal. You know, compared to where a, a conservative sits, they are very liberal. But com there is nobody on the Supreme Court right now that is remotely as liberal as the Supreme Court in the 1970s. That every single member of the Supreme Court right now is more conservative than every single member of that Supreme Court, essentially. That's how much the law has shifted. For better or for worse, there has just been an incredible realignment ideologically of the Supreme Court. Okay. Please all join me in thanking our speaker once again. Thanks very much. Uh, join us for some snacks and drinks and more conversation. Thank you. 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 And more conversation.